As I've said many times in the past, as many of you know, that this is my Bible. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I believe I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. If you believe that with me, say amen. I prayed and prayed and prayed what my first message should be as pastor at Hoover's Gap Church. And I feel that the Lord had spoke to me and He said to me, start at the beginning. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of John? <laughs> you get Start in the beginning, so we'll begin in the book of John. You'll learn who I am. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John, chapter 1. I mean, I really love the Bible. It truly is a good book, a book that I just couldn't put down as I began to read it. And it's a book that needs to be read often. And in fact, here's, here's something you may not know, but in 1776, a man by the name of Voltaire said that in 100 years, this book will become non-existent and it will vanish from the face of this earth. But praise be to God for people like William Tyndale who gave their life in translating this so that we could use it today in the manner that we do. You know, he was actually burned at the stake in front of the church for translating this word into common words that we use today. How often we take for granted his holy word. And, you know, it's accessible to anyone in the United States, but ignored and neglected by just as many. You know, to read the Word literally brings health and healing to our bones. And I'm reminded of a testimony I heard just this morning of a young lady who had an abortion. And after she had that abortion, she said she felt so guilty, she felt so remorseful over that act, that in her mind she was told over and over again that God was so angry at her. So she refused to go to church, she refused to read the Bible, she couldn't do anything but seep deeper into depression. She said, but then she heard a preacher say one time to her, just in passing, read the word. She said, she thought, but I'm so guilty of murder. I'm so guilty of this act I'm, that God hates me. She said, however, when she read the word for herself. You see, folks, it's one thing for me to get up here and preach and say these things, but when you read it for yourself. She said she read it for herself and she found out that God loved her for who she was and that he was willing to forgive her every single day. He wasn't angry at her. He was sad. And he loved her just the same. But she didn't know that until she read it for herself. So with that, we're going to read John chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 5. And then we will go to the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, and we'll read chapter 1 through verse 5 as well. So the first five verses in John and the first five verses in Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Now turn with me to the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis, the beginning, that's exactly what it means. The beginning. Chapter 1, verse 1. Starts out the same way that John started out. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. I'm sorry, on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as I come before you now as a minister of this gospel, as a pastor at Hoover's Gap Church, I pray that your anointing, even as it was prayed at the uh, installation service, Lord, that that anointing would reside here today. I pray that our minds would be in tune, our hearts would be ready to receive, and that we'd be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the height, the breadth, the width, and the depth of your love towards us. Grant unto us wisdom that we may comprehend that which you would have us know today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now before I get what my wife would call off on a rabbit trail, off on the side, let me say these three main points, that God is personable. I say that again, God is personal, God has purpose, and God has a pattern. God is personal. God has a purpose. And God has a pattern. 
In Genesis chapter 1, we read as the same as it read in John chapter 1, that in the beginning, they read the same, in the beginning, in the beginning. And I hope to pray, or I hope and pray, that we here today will be able to see the applicability of these scriptures for our lives today, in the beginning, because each one of us began somewhere. We were born at some point in life where our lives began. And then those of us who are standing here that are born again Christians, we began a second life when we were born again. That is not a born of the flesh as the man who asked me in, in Barstow, California, when I mentioned about being born again. He said, as the word of God said, someone said, he said, but how can I be born again? Can I enter into my mother's womb a second time? Little did I know at the time, that's exactly the same statement that was made in Scripture. That born, born again is of the spirit and that's of the heart to be born again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now I'm going to give you some meat of the word here and what I'm about to share is in no way am I trying to discredit the King James Version or any version of the Bible for that matter. I simply intend to shed light on the word just as the word of God says we are to do and that we are to study to show ourselves approved, a workman who need not be ashamed, accurately dividing the word of truth. So I hope to simply enlighten you today by the word of God. So in the original Hebrew language, there is a word between God created and the heaven. Now this same word, or variance thereof, is shown in the King James Version of the Bible over 5,000 times. However, it is not listed, nor is it shown here. Between the words God created and the heaven. This word is in the original text, but omitted, omitted from the King James Version. Why? I believe it's omitted simply because, as my Bible dictionary tells us, that King James Version of the Bible considered this word to be unrepresented in English. You may have heard of people talking about the Spirit makes intercession for us, groanings and utterings that's too beyond our comprehension or understanding. That's what word, that term speaking in tongues, because the Spirit of God knows how to speak even though we can't comprehend it. The King James Version sees this word and says it is unrepresented representable in English. But I feel I need to share this today because simply of the statement that says, you don't know what you don't know. So you know something new today that between the words God created and the heavens is a word. Now even though this word is not translatable into the English language, we can glean the meaning of this word by how it is used elsewhere in the Bible. In the 5,000 times that this single word is used, it is generally used to point out more definitively the object of a verb or a preposition. And as such, it simply translates it this way. And also it, them, us, we, he, she, me, her, them, mine. Therefore, but of, by, from, therein, unto, to whom, and that. So now I'm not going to say all 5,000 of them, but you get the point. It brings out, it's for a, the preceding of a verb and a preposition. However, this word that is not translated is defined as, oh God, hear me now, it's defined as a signal, literally or even figuratively. It's a flag, a beacon, a monument, an omen, a prodigy, or even as evidence. This word is also demonstrative in the sense of entity, a body, a unit, a being, a person. And properly, this word that's untranslatable or unrepresented in English, I should say, is properly, it simply means to come, as in to come into existence. Here's another nugget of truth. You know, the same word is also not used. In verse 4, between and God saw and the light. In verse 7, between God and the firmament. In verse 16, between great and light. In verse 21, between created and wells. And then it's also used, not used two times in verse 28, one time in verse 29, one time in verse 30, and one time in verse 31. It's also admitted in other places in the Bible, such as in Exodus, where it's uh, Exodus 12 and 27, between the words, when he smote, and the Egyptians. In verse 35 and 5, between the words, an offering of, and let him bring it. So what's the significance of this word, and why do I mention it? I mention it to bring and tie in the two scriptures together between John and Genesis. Because together they have true meaning and importance. Remember the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide the thoughts from intentions. 
So I'm going to let the Word of God do that today as I include this unrepresented Word in the rereading of Genesis chapter 1 to include this unrepresented Word in English. And the, it's just wonderful. Hear, hear the Word. In the beginning... God created as a flag, a beacon, a monument, an omen, a prodigy as evidence demonstrating the entity, a body, a unit, a being, and a person to come. God created with the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was with Him in the beginning. So they created the heaven and the earth. God has a purpose. In verse 2 we read, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I really want to focus on that word moved, but before I do, let's go back and let's look at the overlooked, very easily overlooked meanings of without form, void, and darkness. I want to do so because I want to see ourselves in the word. I want us to see the personal purposefulness of God's creative ability. I want us to have practical application of God's timeless principles. The word without form literally means to lie waste, a desolation, an example of a desert, figuratively of a worthless thing, adverbially in Vain. King James also translates that same word without form as this confusion, empty place, nothing, thing of not, vain, vanity, waste, and wilderness. You know, when I read that, I think of the book of Ecclesiastes where he says over and over and over again, oh, all is vanity, vanity of vanities. That's the same thing God saw in the beginning. The word void literally means to be empty. A blank, empty space. And hear this. An undistinguishable ruin. An undistinguishable ruin. If you think about that for a minute, you think about Hiroshima when they dropped the atomic bombs. You know, after all that massive destruction and everything was laid waste, it was still distinguishable. You know, there was a river that ran right through it. So even those who had the ability to take photographs was able to distinguish in the midst of all of that ruin where it lied and where it was. They were able to make, make the understanding of where the streets were and where certain houses were, even though they were destroyed. But here in the beginning, it was undistinguishable ruin. That's beyond my comprehension, if you think about it, because I always understand where I can recognize something. In fact, just the other day, and I'll kind of boast on myself, we were driving down the road, and normally my wife is the one who's to say it. She knows where she's at, and she's telling me where to go. Well, the other day as I was driving along, she said, Raymond, I don't know where I'm at. And so I just got a big old smile on my face, and I just kept on driving. So as soon as I got to the stoplight and I hung a left, then she said, ah, I know where I'm at. That was then she was recognizable to where she was. In the beginning, it was unrecognizable ruin. The next word is darkness, which literally means, and some of us may have been here in the times of our life, the darkest moments of our days. Darkness literally means misery and destruction, death, ignorance, and sorrow, wickedness, night, and obscurity. I don't know about you, but I see humanity in these words. So let me make it applicable to you and to me today as I read this verse 2 this way. And the earth, and some could say that's you and I before we were born again. And the earth was lying in waste, a desolate, dry, and worthless thing, full of confusion, a wilderness full of vanity and waste, without form. And the earth was a dark space full of undistinguishable ruin. It was void and misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and deep wickedness was seen and shadows gloomed obscurely in the night. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. 
And just as I read that, I'm reminded of the scripture where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Because that's exactly what I see when I see that word darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then to where I want to get to, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Who moved? Not what moved. Who moved? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the creative Spirit, the creative force in the Trinity, the third person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved. The King James Version of the Bible translates this word also as flutter and shake. To flutter. It literally means to brood over and to be relaxed at the same time. You ever seen a hen brood over its young? And a fox or something come up and that hen gets real nervous and starts to clack and move its arms. It's nervous. It's wondering. Holy Spirit didn't do that. Even though it brooded over its creation, it was hovering and fluttering with relaxation and waiting to move. It was literally waiting for God to speak. That creative spirit was moving. That's the same thing that happens to you and I when we cry out to God as I did when I said, God, if you are real, then show me. God, if you are true, then teach me, but just forgive me, Lord. And it said, then the word, just like the word of God says when we read down in verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and then there was light. That's the same thing. The Spirit of God was just waiting for that word to say, move. And when he moves, he creates. He's waiting on that moment to move on your hearts and on your minds. He's waiting. He's hovering. He's fluttering as a hen broods over their young. He's waiting. Now notice the simplicity of the obedience here. God spoke and the Holy Spirit acted in boldness, confidence, and in assurance. Now remember the word I just said actually means to be relaxed as well. Do you know the Spirit of God was not troubled in thinking as I would be? Oh my, how can I do this? God wants me to create light. He didn't think. He didn't worry. He didn't say, God, what kind of light do you mean? Do you mean bright lights, dim lights, iridescent lights, fluorescent lights? No, he knew exactly what the Spirit knew, exactly what the Father wanted, and he gave it. Just like he knows exactly what you need, where you are, and when you are. When you cry out, God, show me light. And he moves on your hearts and on your minds. The Spirit of God was not upset. He wasn't worried. He had peace, just like we can. He can give us that peace that surpasses our understanding. Be relaxed and waiting, waiting for God to speak. And when God speaks, the Holy Spirit responds. That's what I call the Big Bang fact. <laughs> Not a Big Bang theory, a Big Bang fact. God speaks and bang, it happens. You know, the beauty of this illuminating night, light, though, when God spoke and said, let there be light and there was light, is he did not stop there. You and I would have stopped there. In fact, let's read verse 4 and 5 again. It says, and God saw the light, that it was good. And yet then God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Let me interject here. God has a pattern. Amen. This is what I would call going from good to great. Why change something that was good? God saw it. He created it. He said it is good. So why change something that's good? I'll tell you why. Because as you read throughout the word of God, you see that God is nothing less than a great God. In fact, he is the great God, Jehovah, Elohim, Yahweh, El Shaddai. Because in verse 31 where God said, now this is after all the preceding verses, where in the 30 verses before it, he said, in all its goodness, in verse 31 he said, it is very good. Let me just say this even, something I've learned over time. Do you know what the biggest hindrance to good is? I'm sorry, let me, say it, let me reverse that. Because God saw that the light was good, and yet then he did something else. You know what the biggest hindrance to great is? Every one of us want to be great. You know what our biggest hindrance is to being great? Is being good. That is the biggest hindrance to being great is being good. Because how many of us have ever said, you know what, that's just good enough. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to call it a day. God didn't do that. He saw that it was good and he didn't stop there. He turned around and then after he made that which was good better, when he took that which was good and made it great, then and only then did he say, now I'm going to call it a day. Hallelujah. He said, let us go further. Oh, and I like this too, how he showed me this. You know, he said, let me separate the light from darkness. You know, God went further and he began, that's what I believe right then, when he began to spin the world on its axis. Because that's the only way you can get away from light is to turn away from it. He began this old world to start spinning around when he separated light from darkness. Started spinning around and said, now you can't see it anymore. It's, it's on the other side. 
Let me separate light from darkness. Even though the light was good, he divided it. He made it better. He did not stop at good. The only way to rid ourselves of the light is to close out the light, to revolve away from it. Darkness is only here because the light has been hidden. Wherever there is light, there is no darkness. No matter how dim that light may be, there is light. Where there is light, there is no darkness. So let me close with a scripture read from John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. That's John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. Emily, if you want, if you want to come up, we'll have you get ready. We have a baptismal robe over on the left. You can pick and choose. So if you want to come up and go ahead and get a robe on or change if you need to change. For those of you that didn't hear a pastor say yesterday, this is how light comes out of darkness. This is life out of death. Emily, can I give you a hug before you begin? Oh, hallelujah. All right there's Michelle. Would you help her with the robe? I shared this with pastor this morning, and he said, I didn't know that because Emily shared it with me. We had what she called a Q&A session yesterday, didn't we, miss? Huh? Wasn't it good? Three of us just sat right here and we just talked, had a good time of fellowship. She asked a bunch of good adult questions about Christianity and about baptism and about the church. And <laughs> Her best one to me was, if I get baptized here, do I have to come here all the time? <laughs> no. No, ma'am, you don't have to come here all the time, but it's a privilege to offer up this baptismal service for her. We had a great time of fellowship. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21 says, And this is the condemnation. I cannot explain to you the spirit that I feel inside. If you hear this word, I pray it sink deep inside of your spirit, your mind, and your soul. Because this is applicable to us today. And this is the condemnation that the light came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or shown and known. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light and that his deeds may be manifest, seen, or shown that they are wrought in God. Listen, folks, God separated light from darkness in the book of Genesis, and soon and very soon He will do it again. If you don't believe me, just read the book of Matthew, chapter 25, and you'll see that the darkness shall go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting eternal glory. That's Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. Read it. It's a warning to you and to I. At least you think you're perfect. At least you think you've got it going on. At least you think you're good enough. Don't stop at good. Don't let the biggest hindrance to great hold you back. Go from good to great. Turn that which is good to even something better. Don't just stop at saying, God, forgive me. Move on to the next step. You know, the Bible talks about a robe of righteousness and a gown of salvation. Don't just stop with a gown. Reach forward to that robe. Go for the robe. Hallelujah. Here's three more things to think about. Wayne, if you want to think about what you want to play and prepare. I wish I could take credit for these three, but it came out of a commentary. Man, it's good. When God speaks, there is illumination. When God looks, there is inspiration. When God divides, there is instruction. Hallelujah. Illumination. Lord, forgive me, and all of a sudden, all that pain and that worry of the world is washed away, and I've been illuminated. God said, let there be light, and there is light in your heart and in your minds. And then there is inspiration. God, what can I do for you? Not God, what can you do for me? Because that's where I was for 17 years. God, what do you do for me? God, or what are you supposed to do for me? God, you said you would do this. God, you said you would do that. God, you said you would do that. But nowhere in there did I read what I was supposed to do. 
inspiration when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and inspires you to say, God, what can I do for you? Inspiration. And then the instruction on how to do it. Just like that lady who said when she read the Word, she had heard it, she had felt it. I shared that with Emily the other day. She's talking about the devil, how he deceives us. You know what deception really is? Is things that look good, smell good, taste good, and feel good, but are wrong. Fundamentally wrong by the Word of God. Fundamentally accepted and challenged and even encouraged by the world. That which looks good, smells good, feels good, tastes good, but is wrong. And I'm contrary to the Word of God. That's deception. Let the Word of God bring instruction to you. He says, you read through the book of Genesis, you see it again and again and again and where it says, it was so and it was good. In the study, Life Application Study Bible, it says, darkness was dispelled on the first day when God created light. God saw that all He had created was excellent in every way and you are part of God's creation and He is pleased with how He made you. If at times you feel worthless, or of little value, remember that God made you for a good reason. You are valuable to Him. Light and darkness, life from death, both are possible when God, the Word of God, that is the Spirit of the living God, are allowed to move. So here's practical, visual application of life from death. Emily's going to fulfill her promise to Dot Nanny. She's going to be baptized today. We had a good talk yesterday and how very, very sweet she really is. And I know that God is personal, God has a purpose, and God has a pattern. She made a promise to her dot nanny. Dot nanny, when you get out of this hospital, I'll get baptized. How many of us know Miss Dot got out of the hospital? Not in the way that we would expect it. Very good, young man. That's right. Very good. She got out of the hospital. Preacher, you come and do this wonderful honor of bringing life from death. Show us this life, Emily. Swain and Faye, if you want to play, you're welcome to. I'll be glad to assist. Okay. I'm glad Raymond spoke about the move of God and how he moves in our hearts and lives. And uh, when, when Dot went home to heaven, he moved on ours in the hospital and the hurt wasn't this bad, and I was willing to say amen to his will. Uh, I've often told Dot, uh, I can't understand why genes can go three generations and four. I've told her for years, I said, this is little Dot Nanny. She has her characteristics, some mis mischief ideas as Dot Nanny did, her thinking's like that. The first time I said to Dot Nanny, when I approached her about Courtner, I said, uh, would you like to go out to eat? She said, I would not. <laughs> Emily was little. They used to come to visit us when she started walking, and I'd say, come see me. She would lean over and put one hand on one knee and one on the other, and just shake her head. But things develop between me and Dot Nanny, and they've developed between me and Emily, and it's all a move of God because I am at peace, deep, settled peace, and I urge you to trust the Lord. And I'm yeah. thankful for my family and for the church and for all you've done for Dot Nanny and me and this is a great thrill for me today. Emily Reed, having professed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you turn in your celebration hymnals before the benediction is said this morning and sing this little chorus with me? Brother Raymond talked about the, the, the creative work of God, how God takes out of the 
void and the shapelessness and the darkness and make something that is good, he said. 507 says something beautiful. He made something beautiful out of my life. Here we go, sing now. One, two, three. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I promised my cousin that I would never close an altar service or never a service. And as pastor of Hoover's Gap Church, several people have asked me, what will I do? And do differently or what would I change and I don't know that it's changing anything but I want to assure you that we are to have this altar open throughout the entire service Amen. you want to come you feel the spirit of the living living God move on your heart and mind that means you're sitting there and you begin to feel your heart pitter patter that means you sit there and you begin to think in your mind oh God should I would I could I then say yes say yes Lord yes if there's anyone here and uh, Emily even asked me this yesterday she said when I was, uh, during the installation service, <laughs> I'm going to share this too, my oldest daughter said, An how, do you, how do you install something if you're missing some nuts and bolts? <laughs> my daughter's mischievous too. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's me, I put something together and I'm missing parts. But just know that this service is open. And Emily said, what was it you were doing with all those people when they were coming through the line? I said, I was praying for them. I was just praying. I love to pray. Because I believe it is an opportunity where we can really meet God directly right where He wants us, right where He is. So I would continuously offer this altar throughout the service, but at any point after the service, anybody wants to pray, I will gladly stay and pray with anyone. I don't want to change the way that we end our services in that I want to go to the back door and I want to shake hands with everyone that leaves. I want to do that. I want to continue to offer that. But after that, if you want to stay and even pray in private, I will gladly pray and stay with you. But during the service, if you ever feel the unction to move, take and do a powerful thing and move that leg out. Shame the devil and just say, watch me go in boldness and come before the throne of God and say, God, here am I. You may say, I want, to be, I want the darkness to be shed away and that's become born again. You may say, Lord, I'm in the light, but the darkness is coming at me hard. It's hitting me down left and right. Well, then that's when you stand up and come to the throne and you say, God, use me and help me, guide me and direct so I'll open this offering, this floor. We're going to sing it one more time. If anybody wants public prayer, I will gladly pray with you. If you've got something you want us to stand in agreement with you on, we will bind the devil. We will loose it in heaven and loose it on earth. In Jesus' name. So if you want to come, feel free. Rain, would you sing it one more time? Hallelujah. As the offering is open. beautiful. Something good, all things in fusion, he understood, all I had to offer him was try and strive, but he made something beautiful. Out of my life. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray your spirit to go with us this week as we yes. continue in our daily journeys here on this earth, Lord. Make us mindful of your word that we heard today, that between the creation and the heaven, there's a word. Lord, put that word in our spirit this week. Put that word in our hearts and our minds as we witness to others, as we share our faith, or as they share their faith and witness to us. May we meld together, Lord, as we continue in your service as we leave this place. We truly trust that we've met with you here today. I trust that hearts and minds were renewed and spirits were re rejuvenated today. We ask that you would go with us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.